outro cast. Right on time there. How's it going, John? I'm doing great. How are you? Great. Thank you very much. Are you dialing in from, that doesn't look like New York. That is Central Park, believe it or not, right behind me. Wow. Well, congratulations I, on that. I, want, I wanted to pick something that was a lot of fun, at least. Well, Central Park, not too far from the Thanksgiving Day Parade, and you'll be hosting the National Dog Show around then. Do I have that correct? You got it. 21 years now. Right. Did you know when you hosted it the first time that it was a long-term gig like this? Well, no, we uh, were taking a, uh, one of the biggest leaps ever done in programming on television. Uh, John Miller, who was the head of NBC Sports, took home Best in Show, uh, the movie, uh, one weekend and said, uh, as he watched it twice and laughed out loud, said, I know what we're going to do with that two-hour slice between the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and, the, and, the, and football. He said, we're going to do a dog show. Well, they about laughed him out of the office. But by the end of the day, he had put together a license deal with the Kettle Club of Philadelphia, Purina as a presenting sponsor. He called me on Tuesday morning and I picked up the phone in L.A. and he said, woof, woof. And that's how this all started. It was on a wing and a prayer. We had no idea that uh, by the end of the weekend, we were going to have a show that 19 million people watched. Um, it was an overnight success. And uh, that number has grown to over 30 million now. Right. Your career has kind of been a series of accidents, organic, wonderful things that have happened. But did you want to be a host early on in your career? Well, you know, it, it, it's something that came very easily to me because I had wonderful parents. And um, whenever they would have a party at the house, the, our, the kids were in charge of answering the door, taking the coats, serving the drinks. And, um, you know, uh, so I always grew up with, the, you know, that kind of ability, I think, to entertain and, uh, uh, and, 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 and not be the focus of what I'm doing. In our case, that's very true with the National Dog Show, is that the dogs are the stars, not us. We just get out of the way. Hmm. Obviously, you are a heck of a speaker. You, are, you have a distinct voice that everybody recognizes very easily if they pay attention to film and television. But did you have people early on that were trying to get you to speak differently than the way that you do? <laughs> you know, the truth be known, um, my voice was the last one to change in high school. Uh, I, I had a little pipsqueak voice up until then, uh, till I was about 15 and a half, 16 years old. And uh, you know, that's the way it went. But I would say this, I, I have, I mean, I, I studied opera uh, mm -hmm. uh, when I, er, in my early years and still continue to study music. But um, so I learned um, how to use my voice. My voice is an instrument um, and it's used just like any other instrument. Uh, if I want to sing, all I have to do is sustain tone. If I want to speak, I just learn how to place my voice where it needs to be placed and, uh, uh, and it seems to work. But it's, uh, it's an instrument like anything else. So, but now add to that, um, I have a musicality to my voice. That, yes. uh, um, I think I learned back in the late sixties when all of, just as my voice was changing, all of the great DJs were taking over uh, rock and roll. Uh, and, uh, you know, they all, they all had these wonderful voices that sounded like this. Yes. You know, it's like, and, and it was, uh, everything was much more excited than it, than it had to be. But uh, I, I think I learned, I was always admired those, those incredible, incredibly distinct voices. And I think, um, I think I picked up a lot of that back in that time. I think you just did a Cousin Brucey impression. <laughs> That's funny. Cousin Brucey. Well, I remember him well. So you grew up in Connecticut, but when, at what age did you leave Maine? Uh, very young. Now, we, we didn't stay in Maine very long, just long enough for me to pick up my uh, sports allegiances there in, uh, in New England, uh, which includes obviously the Red Sox and all things that are Boston. Um, but uh, no, we ended up living in the Boston area, moved there, and then uh, uh, most of my life was in uh, Connecticut. Got it. You're went to, I went to and, went, and also went to, uh, then I went to college in Rhode Island. So uh, my footprints are all around New England. In fact, my summer home is still there now in Vermont. Oh, wow. But at the same time, Seinfeld filmed in LA, 
but everyone thinks it's a New York show. So you're mm -hmm. kind of identity list. People don't know where you came from, but which do you primarily identify as, as a Connecticut person? Well, I, I identify as a New Englander because, uh, you know, as I say, New England is, is like a big, one big large state. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, very homogenized in that regard. People who um, are born in New England end up staying in New England because everything you need is really in New England. And, uh, you know, you cross the borders very easily there and it doesn't, um, you know, you're not really moving into one distinct area that looks different from the rest. Uh, you know, maybe Bostoners talk a little different than other people in New England, but uh, that's about it. Everything else is pretty homogenized. So, and I also find that, you know, New York is, um, or Boston is uh, New England's New York. So everything you need culturally is right there. So people have a tendency to stay pretty close. Well said. Well, do you have time for a lightning round of fan questions for you before I let you go? Sure. Okay, the first one is a compliment. Uh, Dante Capizzola wants to know, how do you still look the same 20, 30 years later after millions of people first discovered you on Seinfeld? <laughs> I think it's more your eyesight. And <laughs> that's a nice, that's a very nice compliment uh, tucked in there. But I would say it's probably your, your eyesight. I think uh, it's, uh, it may, we may need glasses there. But uh, no, I, I, I look at, you know, I look at myself and I see the little cracks and the crevices coming in slowly but surely. But I, you know, I've been lucky enough to, I have, uh, I have that good Mediterranean skin that came from my grandparents. And uh, so it seems to hold up. Got it. Joseph Hassan wanted to know, if you had an archive like Peterman, which comic strip would you be saving? And is it Ziggy? <laughs> no, believe it or not. And this may seem pompous and arrogant, but back in the 60s, there was a comic book called Richie Rich. Oh, yeah. And I was just fascinated by this. Uh, I was just fascinated by personal wealth, I think. And that comic strip, you know, that comic book, I guess, kind of fell into place with, uh, with kind of what I is just, you know, there was just, they were just so wealthy, it just never stopped. You know, if he wanted a private airplane, he had a private airplane. He did, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, a follow-up from Joseph Hassan. He wanted to know who your favorite Seinfeld peer is off camera. I I'm wondering if it's Fred Stoller. <laughs> you know, uh, I would say Patrick Warburton, probably my, one of my dearest friends. And we do a lot of work together. And I help him out a lot in his charities and what have you like that. But Patrick is just one. He's just big old teddy bear. And I just, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, tied at the wrist and ankles for so many years. Uh, Francis Valentino, who plays drums for David Lee Roth these days, he wanted oh. to know the craziest place that you've been recognized as Peterman. Botswana. <laughs> I hopped off a plane in Botswana on a dirt runway. Uh, I was there to host a National Geographic special for about, about four weeks, uh, living in the brush, for the, trying to uh, photograph and capture the wild dogs of Moremi. Um, and uh, my guide uh, comes to greet me at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the runway as, as the dust is uh, just to clear. And he goes, ooh, Mr. Peterman. And sure enough, he had three weeks, he was three weeks on in Botswana, one week off in um, Johannesburg in South Africa. And when he went back there, he would watch Seinfeld. It was a huge show in South Africa as well. I did not know that. Uh, Ryan Wheeler, who also plays with David Lee Roth, great bass player, he wanted to know, as a fan of your work on Family Feud, and in general, your hosting, how you got so good with small talk. Well, that's interesting. Um, that is the tough thing. But, you know, I go on stage with no script and... I say one prayer before I go on stage, and this is for Broadway or anything else I do. I say, God, let me be surprised. That's it. That's the one prayer I say. And I walk on stage and that's it. And what it does is it relaxes me. But more importantly, it makes me focus on what someone is actually saying, looking in their eyes, drawing in everything I can about it. And you'd be surprised how easy it is when you actually give the person that you're talking to the attention that they deserve, conversation actually comes very easily. And then I just happen to have, you know, a very sarcastic and, and um, unusual sense of humor, uh, which I is partly Irish, I would suppose. 
but it's and also very self-deprecating. I'm I'm yeah. I'm the butt I'm the butt of my own joke. So it's tough I to hit a moving it. it's tough to hit a moving target. And the last question I've got before I let you go, because I asked two questions from people who've played with David Lee Roth. My question, have you encountered any members of Van Halen in your, you know, 40, 50 years of show business success? They have managed to be distinctively elusive for my life. And I don't know whether it's intentional or whether I'm just walking in the wrong parts of town, but they have been distinctively elusive. John, thank you for the many years of great entertainment. Looking forward to the National Dog Show, whatever else you got coming up soon. Thanks again. Nice to talk to you. Outrocast.